The School at the Chalet Chapter 3 The Joys of Paris Rien à déclare, rien à déclare, replied Madge firmly, with one eye on her two charges. The custom house official grunted as he chalked the mark on the three suitcases, which was all the luggage they had with them, Mademoiselle La Portée and Dick having gone out to the Tarnsey early in the previous week with the trunks and cases of books, ornaments and pictures, which were all they were taking with them from England. Experienced Joey promptly helped to fasten the case again, while Grizel, flushed and excited, gazed round her, wondering in her big gray eyes. She had never been out of England in her whole life, so even the draughty, prosaic dawn of Boulogne, where everyone had to go in a queue with their cases, was in interesting with certain pleasure glamour to her. The hoarse voices of the Donier, the clamor of their fellow passengers, the unusual trains with their funny high engines and the little steps up into the carriage were all fresh and new to her. Madge cast an amused glance at her absorbed face as they settled down in their second-class carriage. The only other occupant was a little fat man in a loud check suit. He was mopping his face with a white handkerchief adorned with scarlet poppies. "'Oh, it's hot, ain't it?' he said. His accent at once betrayed him for a Yorkshireman. "'Ought for this time of year!' Madge was always interested in people, so instead of snubbing the good-hearted little man's advances with frosty good breeding, she answered him pleasantly. He had had little education, as was evident, but he felt a kind a kindly, if curious, interest in the trio in his carriage, and when, a little later, they produced sandwiches and milk, he vanished to return with some magnificent gooseberries, which he begged them to share with him. Again Grizel looked for the icy, polite snob her stepmother would have given him. Madge only thanked him for his kindness, with direct simplicity, which was so much a part of her charm. Over their meal they became quite friendly, and before they reached Paris he found out that she proposed running a school in the Troll. He commended her scheme and offered to try to find her pupils among his customers. He was a wool manufacturer from Bradford, as it turned out. They were quite sorry to say goodbye to him when they reached Paris, but he was going to Lyon that night, and they were to spend the night or the next two or three days in the jolliest city in the world. It was five o'clock, or seventeen, if you cared to take French time. By the time they had arrived, and both Joe and Grizel were tired, so Madge made no attempt to do anything that night. They went to their hotel, a quiet one, not far from the Madeleine, and after having arranged for the rem remainder of the week, they were shown to their rooms, where the a la Angeles was sent up. They all woke really early, and after petit déjeuner of coffee and rolls, prepared to go out. Naturally, since they were so near the Madeleine, was their first objective. Jo had seen it before, but she was perfectly willing to visit the great church, which Napoleon had begun as a temple of glory and which was destined never to finish, Grizel looked at it with wonder in her face. Somehow, I didn't think Napoleon was a religious man, she observed thoughtfully. Whatever made him want to build a church? He wasn't and he didn't, explained Madge. I forgot what his idea was, but it certainly wasn't the idea of the average man. But then he wasn't an average man, of course. Anyway, it's rather a wonderful thing, isn't it? Not to be compared with Notre Dame, of course. Is he buried here? asked Grizel. No, in the Invalides, replied Joe, who was an enthusiastic admirer of the great emperor. Well, I think we've seen everything here, so we may as well go to the Champs Elysees, said Madge. We'll take a bus. Then they'll go up in a little way and get another bus to the Point Alexander. From there, it's easy to get to the Invalides. We'll have du jour, 
and after that, we go to the Louvre by the Metro. And the opera tonight, supplemented Joey, who said topping. Madge nodded. Mr. Cochran had given her an additional check with the request that she would take Grizel about as much as possible. He was not a devoted father, but some strange feeling of regret that he meant so little to his only child had prompted him to do this. Children always enjoy that sort of thing, better when someone of their own age is with them, he said, said to her. Please include Miss Joey in the party. Are you really going to the opera? asked Grizel incredulously. Yes, it's La Boheme tonight. I don't know how much of it you'll understand, but the music is lovely, replied Madge. As they boarded a bus, look out of the window, Grizel. We're coming to the Palace de la Concorde, where the guillotine stood during the Reign of Terror. Joey, the insatiable reader, murmured softly, Sidney Carton. But Grizel's knowledge of the French Revolution was confined to that gained from the Scarlet Pimpernel stories, and when, as they reached the famous space, the younger girl softly quoted the closing sentence from A Tale of Two Cities, she paid no heed. The champs élysées pleased her far more than their bustling life. Madge chuckled softly to herself as she walked between them. The outlook of the two children was so totally different. Joey always saw Paris through a rose mist of history and legend. Grizel, now that her first wonder was over, so obviously took all that side of it from for granted and devoted herself to its life and people. After Les Invaldes, they had du jour at one of the many restaurants and then took the metro to the Louvre. The opera was an entire success. True, neither of the girls understood much of the story, but the exquisite music appealed to both, and even after the facts, Grizel felt a lump come into her throat when Mimi died. The next day was devoted to a trip up the river to St. Cloud and the Sevres, which pleased Miss Cochran far more than the Louvre. I like to see things done, she explained to Joey. Of course, pictures and statues are all right, but they are not half so interesting as seeing people do things now. And I think St. Cloud is awfully jolly. I wish we'd been able to go up the Eiffel Tower, though. You've done quite enough for today, declared Madge, with an anxious eye on Joey's white face. Tomorrow we'll go out to Versailles, and, w and then on Monday we must be getting on. And the next day they went to Versailles and spent long happy hours wandering about the magnificent extravagances of Louis the Fourteenth. The garden filled them with admiration, and Grisel thrilled at seeing the Hall of Mirrors, where the peace treaty had ended the Great War. From there, they went on to the Trionion, with their dainty artifi artificiality, where poor Marie Antoinette and her court ladies had played at being milkmaids and shepherdesses clad in flowered silks, while less than twenty miles away, the Paris mob was beginning to cry aloud for bread. The whole place was peopled with exquisite ghosts for both Madge and Joe, and even Grizel became infected by them, and half expected to see some hooped and powdered lady with raised fan and brilliant eyes beckon to her from behind one of the statues. Madge was wise enough to take them back early, after they had seen the famous fountains playing and next day was spent in visiting Notre Dame and looking at the shops. Grizel was anxious to buy everything she saw, but Madge kept a tight rein on her. She would only allow her to change a little of her money in francs, and then she insisted the choice must be carefully made. Finally at the Louvre, a lace collar was chosen for cook. Several postcards were bought and sent off. Then, at Joey's suggestion, they went to the Luxembourg Gardens, which lay both in April sunshine. 
Grizel was deeply interested in the French children who romped about there, carefully watched by mothers and nurses. The carousel, with its lions and elephants and little hurdy-gurdy, took her fancy completely, and she insisted on having several goes, rather to the amusement of Joe, who stayed off to the fountain, where several bare-legged and cropped-haired small boys were sailing their boats. Grizel laughed. Oh, Joey, I think it's lovely, and I caught the ring five times. The man said it was superb. Well, now, let's have du jour, suggested Madge. I'm hungry if you aren't. Du jour over, they strolled along the Champs-Élysées and joined the merry throng round Gongno, which is a French version of Punch and Judy. Tea they had at Patisserie, where Grizel joined once more in the delightful custom which ordains that each customer shall take plate and fork to the counter and help himself to delicious sandwiches and cakes before settling down. So much more sensible than English shops, she said. They always bring the things you don't want. Like horrid spongy cakes with butter icing, chimed in Joe. I loathe them. Now, eclairs, I could go on eating forever. And beautifully sick you would be, Madge said firmly. No, you don't, Joey, my child. Remember, our train leaves at nine. Finished? After that, they returned to their hotel to pack up and have dinner. At half past eight, saw them at the Gare de l'Est, climbed into the Paris Wayne Express train. Here, here start our artesian adventures, observed Joe, as she curled herself up comfortably in the corner. You can't count on Paris. Can't you? I do, replied Grizel. It's all been absolutely thrilling so far. Go to sleep and don't talk, ordered Miss Bettany. We shall be in Switzerland, I hope, when you wake up tomorrow. Switzerland, Grizel sat bolt upright in her excitement. Yes, we reach Basel about six in the morning. Now, be quiet. And she refused to say another word or to let them talk, so they subsided, and before long all three were fast asleep while the great train hurtled onward through the darkness. Chapter 4. Austria at Last It was half past seven on the Wednesday evening when the Vienna Express slackened speed before entering Innsbruck Station. By this time, Grizel was weary of the train, while Joe's tongue had long ceased wagging, and she lay in her corner of the carriage gazing dreamily out at the darkening landscape. "'We're only an hour late,' observed Madge, as she collected their belongings together. "'We've missed the last train of the mountain railway,' So we'll have to go to a hotel somewhere for the night. I shan't be sorry, replied Grizel decidedly. Will Mr. Bettany meet us, or shall we have to fish for ourselves? Dick will meet us all right, said Joe, rousing herself up to answer the question. Where shall we put up, Madge? At the Europe? I suppose so, replied her sister. Or there's the Creed, only it's further away. I hope it's somewhere near, replied Joe wearily. I should like to have a bath and go to bed. There's Dick, exclaimed Madge, as she hung out of the window. But Dick had seen her, and was already running along by the side of the carriage, shouting a cheery greeting to them. Shove the cases through the window, he called, as the train stopped. Bustle the children out. I've got a porter here. Room's booked at the Europe. Dick was an experienced traveler, and both he and Madge spoke German fluently, so they were soon past the barriers and out into the big square, where the carriage intended for two horses, but drawn by one only, were waiting for hire, while the coachmen, picturesque enough figures in their short open jackets, full shirts, and little green trolleys hats, with the inevitable feather in the back, leant up against the wheels shouting chafe to each other, or smoking their long china bold pipes. Beyond they could see the great snow-capped mountains towering up on all sides, while round them 
Throngs of tow-head, gray-eyed children begged for Cronin, with the persistence which suddenly died away as Dick addressed them with a ready flow of language. "'Awful little beggars,' he said as they dispersed. "'They're nearly as bad as the, as the people at Port Said. Tired, Grizel? Here's our hotel. Nice and handy for the station. You see?' "'Is everything all right at the chalet?' asked Madge, as they entered the big hotel. "'Has Mademoiselle's cousin arrived?' "'I've got another pupil, an American called Evandi, Venice. "'She's coming in September.' "'Good for you,' replied her brother. "'Yes, everything's all right. And the kid?' "'Simone, her name is, arrived Friday last week. "'Mademoiselle stayed down here till today and sent up the things by rail. "'I got the place scrubbed out. "'Dear old Frau Piffin came along, and her eldest girl.' and we've got it quite shipshape. There's a big room they built on, and we've turned it into a classroom. I knocked up some shelves, and we've got the books up. Two little rooms we've given to you and Mademoiselle's, and a huge loft after we've put the kids' beds in. It holds eight easily, so you'd better buck up and get four more. There's a landing stage just opposite, and the water's quite shallow. Old Brown at the Crone Prince Carl says they can bathe from there into the summer. Now, I'll get your keys, and then you can go and beautify yourselves while I order some food for you. Come down to the Spazlil when you are ready. What's a Spazel? asked Grizel as they went up into the lift. It's German for dining room, explained Madge. Here we are. Now buckle up, you two, and make yourselves tidy, and then come up and tap on my door. They hastened joyously, and in a marvelously short time they were ready. Then they went down to the dining room, where they found Dick and a delightful meal waiting them together with a waiter. Nothing really exciting, said Dick, only Bratton. All right, Gretel? That's German for roast veal, and Katrofellen, otherwise spuds, and apple tort, which isn't apple tort, although it sounds like it. What is it then, Grizel wanted to know? Sort of a cake with cooked apples on it, said Joe swiftly. Oh, it is so nice to have the funny things again. I think foreign food is really more interesting than English. Must we really go to bed after supper? I don't want to. It'll be nine o'clock before you're settled, retorted her brother. You can trot round Innsbruck tomorrow if you're so keen. I won't run away in the night, you, you know. When do you go to the Tarnzi? asked Grizel. Not till half past seven train tomorrow evening, replied Madge. There are one or two things I want to get, and you really must see the little Innsbruck while you are here. We will go to the Ferdinandium Museum and the Hofferkirk, and you must see the old house with the golden roof. <gasps> Is it really gold? asked Grizel in awestruck tones. Oh dear, no. It's really just the roof of the balcony to a window, but it's very famous, and you ought to see it. Then there's the Maria Theresian Strasse, with its uh, swagger shops, chimed in Dick, and the great triumphal arch, and you must go down and have a look at the inn. You'll have plenty to do tomorrow, I can assure you. I'll go up during the morning, Madge, and take the case, and then you and the kids can come on later. Everyone agreed to this program, and Joe and Grizel went off to bed quite happily, while their elder took a stroll up to the little station, where the electric railway, which is known as the Stube Ban, begins. You ought to take the kids up here some day, observed Dick. Some day, agreed Madge. But do remember that I'm here to start a school in the first place. Geography, he said shortly, with a twinkle in his eye. You might make a weekend exploration of it in the summer and take them to the edge of the Stubai Glacier. You could get rooms in the Fulpims 
And the Sturbay Valley is lovely, I know, said Madge, sighing. It all is. But, oh, Dick, supposing it isn't a success, suppose I fail. Tosh, he said easily. You won't fail. You've got too much grit for that. Other people might. But you'll go on. Buckle up, old thing. But I'm so young, she said. I'm only twenty-four, Dick. He gave her an arm, reassuringly squeezed. You'll pull through, all right. Keep your hair on, old girl. We'd better be getting back now. You're tired and ought to go to bed. Yes, I am, acknowledged Madge. Oh, Dick, I shall be so thankful to get to our own house. I must say it sounds attractive. What is little Simone like? Didn't see much of her, he replied. She stuck me a jolly quiet. Very dark, of course. Not a bit pretty like that Grizel kid. "'Yes, Grizel will be lovely when she's grown up,' said his sister. "'I should think she's clever, too. "'Oh, Dick, she and Joe were too funny for for anything in Paris. "'Joey was dreamy in all her history, "'and Grizel is so absolutely matter-of-fact. "'She simply couldn't understand Joey in her dream pictures.' "'Jolly good job,' said Dick austerely. "'Joe dreams far too much.' "'Well, she hasn't had much chance to do anything else,' replied Madge. "'Perhaps Grizel and Simone and Evadne, when they all come together, will make her different.' "'Oh, she'll be better in the mountains,' was his answer. "'Half the trouble has been her health. "'She's better already, I think, even though she's tired.' "'It can rain at the Tarnzee, Madge reminded him. "'I know that, but... She'll have companions of her own. And don't you worry, my chicken. Everything's going grandly. With this reassurance, the subject was dropped, and presently they reached the hotel and Madge retired to bed. The next day was spent in shopping and sightseeing. Dick left them early in the day and went up to the Tarnsey with the cases and the rugs, while the three girls explored the city to their heart's content. Grizel, quick to learn, was already picking up phrases in German, and she took the greatest delight in practicing them. Joe, whose German had been fluent in the past, found it coming back to her, even as her French had begun to do in Paris. She instructed her friends as they went about, and evidently poured so much information into her that it was small wonder that the Grisel became muddled. The result was a mistake that the Bettanese remembered against her for a long time. Madge had decided to take both children to have their hair shampooed before going up to the lake. She remembered from her last sojourn to the Troll, a very good hairdresser shop in the Museum Strasse, and there she took them. The hairdresser had a little English, but not much. When the shampooing was over, she asked them whether the final rin rinsing should be of hot or cold water. The German for hot water is Hesis Wazel. Joe came through the ordeal all right, demanding lukewarm rinsing for the last. Not so Grizel. She forgot that German for cold was, but remembered, as she imagined, the word for hot. The temptation to exhibit her knowledge of his language was too great to resist, and she reduced the man to horrified silence, and the Bettany girls to helpless laughter by bodily demanding Helege Wasser. It was the expression of outrage on Herr Alphen's face as much as anything that rendered it impossible for Madge to do anything but choke wildly, while he himself, a most devout Catholic, decided that this was only one more example of the madness of the English. It struck him as profane to the extreme that anyone should demand to have her hair rinsed with holy water. With a resigned expression and outspread hands, he carefully explained that it was impossible to give her what she asked. He assured her, however, that he would put some of his very best toilet preparations into what was used if she would only say whether she would have hot or cold, or like the others. 
lukewarm. Of all this harangue which was poured forth to top speed, Grizel understood not one word. Finally, Madge choked with laughter, with great difficulty came to the rescue, and the shampoo was finished. But I don't see what there was that you were giggling at, observed Grizel to Joey, when they had finally left the shop. And why did that man get so fussy when I asked for hot rinsing water? Did he think I should catch cold after it? I wanted a cold rinse, as a matter of fact, but I couldn't remember the word for it, so I asked for hot. That's just what you didn't do, Joey informed her solemnly. You've shocked poor Herr Alfin most horribly, and I'm not surprised. I only wonder he finished you at all. But why? What did I do? demanded the bewildered Grizel. Oh, you only asked for a final rinse in holy water, and he a Catholic, at least I suppose so. But I only said that you what you told me, protested Grizel. There's rather a like in sound, admitted Joey. The beginnings are the same anyhow. I wonder if he's got over it yet. At first Grizel was inclined to accuse her friend of pulling her leg, but when she finally realized the mistake was her own, she cheerfully joined in laughing against herself. Well, anyhow, that's one thing I shan't forget, she said, as they made their way to the station. I couldn't if I tried after that. I don't believe you could, agreed Joe. Madge was buying their tickets at the Sparts. If you'd insisted, I wonder if he would have tried to get you some. They're awfully obliging here, you know. Hello, Madge. Got them all right? Doesn't it feel grand to count in hundreds and thousands? No, rather a nuisance, replied her sister. Now, come along. Our train is over here. Have you got those books safe, Joey? The journey from Innsbruck to Spots is of no particular interest, but the little mountain railway, which carries uh, you up to a height of 3,000 feet and more above the sea level, is something to remember. Higher and higher they climbed, now and then stopping at a tiny wayside station, till at last they reached the Great Alm, and there... Before them, dark, beautiful, and clear as a mirror, spread the Tarnzi, which, with its three tiny hamlets and two little villages round its shores, and towering round on all sides the mighty limestone crags and peaks of mountains. The railway terminus is known as the Sea Spits, and here the steamer was waiting for the passengers. Dick was there, too, ready to help with the parcels. It's jolly walk round the lake, he said, but tonight think we'll take the steamer. It's about a quarter of a mile nearer from the Brazu landing stage, and then it is from here, and I know you're all tired. The little steamer waited ten minutes, and then her whistle blew, and off she went, first to the Bacu at the opposite side of the lake, and then to the Brazu where they were welcomed by good Frau Pepin, who almost wept for joy at beholding Madge and Joey once more. From the landing stage to the chalet was a good ten minutes' walk, and then they saw the welcoming lights and heard Mademoiselle's warm French greeting. They were at the chalet school at last. Miss Retro Reads is brought to you by Anchor. Anchor is an app that helps you record your podcasts, edit it, insert music or sound effects, or even background music. There's so much more you can do with this app than I do. And they distribute it wherever you're listening to it right now. So thanks, Anchor, and thank you for listening to Miss Retro Reads. Grimm's Fairy Tales Little Red Riding Hood